Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. If you're new to Calvary Chapel, before I start reading, I wanted to let you know this. If you're new, right now you came in, we begin chapter 6. That means that last time we were together, we finished up chapter 5. If you miss next week, you're going to say, where are they at? We'll just be a little bit further on down the line on, in chapter 6. We take it book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That way you receive the whole context of the scripture and you're able to kind of bring it together and pull it together. And the Lord will minister to you. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 says, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And now he could not do mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Church, you may be seated at this time. You know, this section of Scripture, it's a little part of Scripture, but it's very important for us. And why is it important for us? Well, as we finish up chapter 5, remember Jesus had healed the woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. And Jesus had raised Jairus. To Jairus' daughter, who at 12 years old was dying, dying, and died. And so we come from a part of Scripture where everything has been, as Jesus does these miracles, his disciples who are on OJT, on-the-job training, they're pumped. They're hanging out with Jesus and saying, man, this is a great time. This is a very positive time, as we say in our culture today. Very positive, right? But here's the deal. We come into a section of Scripture that really it's kind of like a bummer. It is a bummer because coming back to his hometown, Jesus of Nazareth is rejected in Nazareth, or as the guys in the world would say, he's rejected by his homies. <laughs> he's rejected by his own people. And you would think that it would be a big party. You would think that there would be a, a parade of some type. They're hearing what Jesus has done. They've heard the word has gotten out there. But instead of receiving him, instead of making some whoop de do about him, you know, they don't. And so we go from lots of faith to little faith to no faith at all. It's not a good thing, of course, because every time your faith is shut down or it's, it's smothered, if you may, it's like the light can't shine. That's why the Lord says it is impossible to please him without faith. We must put our works in, in faith. We must take those steps of action. When we call someone, how are you? I'm sick. You know, it's, it's nice to say, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, this and that. Listen, you're a Christian. You say you're a Christian. You've been carrying this Bible for years. You've got Bible muscles probably in your arm. Pray for them. Don't get off the phone until you pray with them. You know, give them a spark. Encourage your brothers and sisters. That faith of yours ignites their faith, and they're able to perhaps break through the darkness as God helps them. So it's a good thing. Well, Jesus comes home and uh, no welcome no heroes welcome there. And so we're going to see this, but I think it's here because the disciples were so encouraged, and now they see something that takes them by surprise. In, in fact, they're probably shocked that uh, Jesus' own people, where he was raised, have shut him down. Now, remember, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? And then after the, uh, he was born, the angel comes and tells Joseph, hey, get your child, let's go, because the king is going to... Uh, seek him out to kill him. And so they were gone. Like two years they were gone. When he comes back, instead of going to Bethlehem to settle, they went to uh, Nazareth. And so that's where Jesus was raised. So he's about two years old, moved into Nazareth, and that's where he's raised, and that's where the people get to know him. He goes to little nursery school probably. And he gets his little first little hammer, like, you know, it's Christmas time, so you're going to buy little hammers for the little kids and screwdrivers for those little boys. He was a carpenter's son. He learned the trade. And so the Nazarenes, the Naz people from Nazareth, they knew him. Right here it says they knew his brothers and his sisters. We're going to cover that in just a few moments. And, and yet, at the end, they 
still see him as that little kid that was raised up at home. They do not attribute honor and glory to him. So it's kind of like uh, you going home, sharing with the family or whatever, and uh, nobody like, you know, you're still the same little kid. You're wet behind the ears or whatever, you know. And you say, hey, this is what I found out. We can be doing this as a family and saying, yeah, and they're seeing junior. They're not really taking you serious. And so there's a stigma with that, and, and there's a problem with that. And the problem is that Jesus could not do much miracles there because of the lack of faith. All right, that was the sermon. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Good night. No, just kidding. Let's pick it up. I just wanted to give you that little background. And we certainly are glad that you're here with us, especially if you're visiting for the first time. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Montrose. Uh, you're here, and we continue through the Gospel of Mark. <coughs> so again, as we completed Chapter 5, Jesus spoke a word of hope. He spoke a word of faith and a word of power as he brought Jairus' 12-year-old daughter back to life. Now, Mark, our author, gave us a great insight, a great insight to the woman who had been sick and made her way uh, uh, to Jesus and, and how Jesus, through her faith, healed her. And then we saw uh, Mark brings out Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, how he's, they told him, hey, don't bother the teacher anymore. The child is dead. And his faith could have been crushed right there. But Jesus gave him that word of hope. You know, don't worry. You know, let's go. You know, and he still went there. And in both cases, we saw belief. We saw their faith. And it accomplished much. Your faith accomplishes much. Your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not your faith in, oh, I'm so good. I have the right words. I'm going to, you know, be on Dr. Phil and give him encouragement. No, no, no. Your faith in Christ, Christ will use you as a light, use you as that person. So we begin chapter 6, guess what? We begin chapter 6 with the opposite. The opposite of faith going to work, we begin to, what we see here is almost no faith at all. So let's tune in as God, through Mark, our author, relates to us what Jesus found in his own hometown. We draw your attention to verse 1. Hope you didn't shut your Bible. We want to read through it as we go through our study this morning. It says, verse 1, then he went out from there, and he came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. Now, church, they have just done this miracle. So his disciples are jazzed. They're hanging out with Jesus. They've come now to his own country, meaning to Nazareth, where he was raised. And according to the Bible record, specifically the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 to 30, Jesus had been in Nazareth, not with his disciples, but he had been there the year before. And at that time, he had gone into the synagogue and on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. <coughs> and they handed him the book of Isaiah. Now, we have Bibles. In those days, they had scrolls. So they went to the uh, scroll-keeping closet, if you may. They pulled it out, and they brought it to him to read, right? So they saw him. Now, something about, about uh, uh, being in Israel and seeing the rabbis. You'll always see whether we're around Temple Square or we're around somewhere else, You'll always see like these teachers and they're, they're kind of, uh, uh, you can see that they're preached like people, right? And there's always people following them. And you'll see that all the time. And then he sits and he'll expose a few words and like he has these students, oh, hmm, ah, you know, and, and that's just the culture. And so they knew about Jesus that year before. He walks into uh, uh, that, that synagogue and they immediately recognize it. So they gave him an opportunity to read the Bible, as we would call it, scrolls at that time, and they give him the scroll of Isaiah. Now, they have already heard what he's been doing. That's why he has that open door, okay? They just don't pick anyone. Oh, yeah, get up there and read the Bible. You were arrested last night. It's not a good thing. Oh, yeah, come over here to the church. Yeah, we'll let you teach. No, no, no. We don't do those kind of things, right? You have to, you know, show that you're serious about the things of God. And, and so they knew about Jesus, and so they invite him up. They give him the scroll uh, about the prophet Isaiah, and this is what he opens. He opens it up. Everybody's quiet, right? And he begins to speak. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's reading it from Isaiah the prophet, 1,000 years before this day. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You could hear a pin fall with itself. They're looking at him, but he is speaking it. He is reading it with such familiarity. Why? Because Jesus is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus came down from heaven, the God-man, right? He's come down. He knows this is written. 
His spirit probably, or the Holy Spirit, remember God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, um, moved in Isaiah's life when he wrote this. And so when Jesus is reading it, Jesus is God, you can believe every ear, every eye is locked in on him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And they're like a bell ding, ding, ding. They've heard what he's been doing. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. When he said that, he closed the book the scroll, and he gave it to the attendant. He sat down. Every eye was on him. Every ear was, who's going to say something next? How do you follow up with what he just said? And he began to say to them, check this out. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What would you have done if you were there? What would you have done if you had been following the Lord? You would have given uh, uh, what we would call a Nazarene applaud. You would have been just, oh my, you're the Messiah. You, you who know now would have said, this is Jesus. He's the one that's healed the blind. He's the one that's healed the brokenhearted. Jairus, we just read about him. The woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus has just restored them. And he says to them, I'm the man that God has sent. You know, so Jesus was the promised Messiah that the prophet had spoken about and that day, the scripture had been fulfilled, as he said, in their hearing. Church, there should have been the greatest party, a greatest applause. There should have been a welcome home party. The ladies of the church, the men of the church should have all got on and said, we, got, we can't just let, let's throw a party. Homeboy has done well and has come home. I don't care what the heading would have been, but they should have recognized. But instead of a hero's welcome, Jesus was rejected by his own hometown people, the Nazarenes. In fact, they tried to throw him off a cliff because they were offended, because he was so different. A carpenter done well, they could accept. But a carpenter that taught in the synagogue, a, a carpenter that had power to heal and to do ministry, you know, uh, he did these things when his brothers and sisters could not. So he was very different, peculiar to them. He was different, and they offended. They were offended by him. And that was his first time there that he had come alone. He had come alone. Let me ask you, church, how many of you guys are grateful for second chances? Right? Are you grateful for a second chance? I know I'm grateful for a second chance. I love the song that Selena was just encouraging us, you know, wanderer or backside or sinner, come home. You're not that far that there's not a problem that heaven cannot take care of. There's not a problem here today, this morning, that the Lord cannot address and cannot take care of. It's amazing God that we have. So we are grateful for second chances. And so it was grace on Jesus' behalf to give his hometown people another chance. Another chance to do great works among them. As it was for us, so it is for them. One more chance to hear his word. One more chance to believe. One more chance to be saved. Church, this time, Jesus was not alone, though. He sought out the salvations of his enemies, we read. But we read here in verse 1 that his disciples were with him. For they had left all to follow him. We know that. But here's the deal. I, I believe Jesus, he's always the, the, the constant teacher. And he's showing his boys. You know, we all had a high when we healed, when we brought Jairus' daughter back to life, when we healed this woman, you know, and, and before that we were across the sea, and so the man of the tombs, we restored him. We came through the storm, you know, uh, God uh, helped us there, you know, and all these things, they're all in a high, but you know what Jesus is teaching them? It won't always be a high. You might get a chance to go home and there's going to be bummers. You go and your family is still looking at you like if you're still that kid, like I said before, who's still wet behind the ears. So they don't want to receive from you. So what are we supposed to do? Fold it up and not go, go to them anymore? 
I don't think so. This lesson is here for these disciples to learn because one day they're going to be going to their homes. One day we're going to be going back to wherever we came from. Olathe, thank God, right? We've got, got to go back there to do whatever. You know, we'll be do going wherever. So they're learning. They're seeing, wow, you know, this is different. As it was for us, so it is for them. One more chance. And so this time, again, he has his disciples with him. Verse 2. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Here it is a year later. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? And notice it's an exclamation mark. It's not saying, and what mighty, uh, what mighty works are performed by his hands? Does it say that? No. Yeah, in English, they put an exclamation mark. So that you realize there's a point being made. And so he said, and, and what wisdom is this which is given to him? That such mighty works are performed by his hands. Look what this, carp this carpenter that knew how to nail things. This carpenter that knew how to cut wood. These hands of his. Look what they're doing now. Look what they're doing now. Look what he's accomplishing. So church, the reputation that Jesus now had obviously had preceded him. This is why most likely they allowed him to come in to their church, that is, their synagogue, to do the reading. These people who thought they knew him because Jesus, though born in Bethlehem, was raised as a carpenter in Nazareth, these people, though they thought they knew him, get this, they didn't know him at all. They did not know him. Now, this time they did not try to chase him or try to kill him, but they did not take him seriously. Church, they were spiritually dead. When I say Tried to kill him. If you remember the year before through Luke's gospel, they marched him, marched, they were pushing him towards the end of a cliff. And the Bible says that Jesus kind of just walked right through them and someone's crowd, the, the crowd is this and that, they're trying to do something. And, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd. Hopefully you haven't done something bad and you try to disappear in the crowd. But that's where the people disappear, is in the crowd. And so Jesus was able to walk through them. I'm sure the Lord had his hand on it and they didn't accomplish what they wanted to do. One year later, here he is again. I'm glad he's giving them this second chance. But they didn't know him at all. Verse 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were uh, offended with him. Well, church, this verse obviously reveals two things to us. Let me give you that first one. The first thing it reveals is that the Nazarenes themselves, they actually believed what other Jews said about them. And what did the other Jews say about them? What did these Jews in the south say about these guys in the north? You know, it's kind of like when we talk about the Yankees or we talk about the south or we talk about this and that. The same thing was going on. How, what do we say about the people from western Kentucky? You know? Uh, I shared with you being raised as an Angelino in Los Angeles and whatnot, and then going to basic training in Kentucky, right? Uh, when they started speaking words like, I'm going to learn you something, go over yonder, come down to the holler, I thought Daniel Boone was going to come out of the woods. It's a whole different world, right? So the Nazarenes are up north in Nazareth. So what were the rest of the Jews saying about these guys? Well, this is what they said. They say, could anything good come out of Nazareth? That was always a saying among them. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In fact, you know, that was the saying, you know, can anything good come out of this? So, yes, they, the Nazarenes, were astonished at his words, we learned, at his wisdom. Yes, they were blown away by what they had heard that he had accomplished, but he hadn't done it there, Right? They hadn't done it there, but they had heard all these things. But they did not believe themselves that Nazareth, their own people, could produce anyone like Jesus. They were, they were looking at themselves and judging Jesus as a commoner. Thank God for healthy lungs, huh? Praise the Lord. In fact, when we read that they ask, is this not the carpenter's son of Mary, right? Church, this was insulting to him. They were throwing a little, like we say, eh, he threw rocks at us. Meaning they, they insulted him on the side. Why? Because in that day, you did not identify a son uh, by calling him, you know, uh, uh, the son of Mary. Of the, you never used the mother's name. They would always use uh, his father, you know. 
call, they called him the son of his father, not the son of the mother. You know, that was key to them. You know, when they say, uh, I meet the market, they, uh, I'm at the Walmart or something like that. I, I remember when my kids were smaller, they would say, are these Judy's girls? They would never say that. They always would say, are these Ben's kids? You know, are these Ben's girls? Yes, and this is my wife, Judy, you know, whatever. You know, it's always like that. And in this culture, in Middle Eastern culture, it was always like that. It's kind of like a little put down. So we learned that from the first verse. The second thing that this verse reveals is that Mary had other children. Now, I know it depends how you were raised. If you were raised like my family was raised. Uh, in Catholicism, Catholicism, still, they're, they're still Christians. Let me say to you why. We agree on the majors. And what are the majors in a relationship with God? You believe that God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinity that three are one. And we believe that Jesus was virgin born. Catholicism agrees with that. So we are united here. But in Catholicism, you know, we learn some other things. In, let me just give you a couple little things. In my family's house, when we were being raised up, we had a Bible. What was it called? Holy Bible. This big, bam, in the middle of the house. What did we use it for? Well, certainly we didn't read it. We couldn't read it, right? It was to dust, to keep it very nice. We shuffled it this way, might shuffle it that way. And people will walk in, oh, the Holy Bible, right? Try and, no, you don't read it. Why? That's what the priests are for. They're supposed to share that with you. I don't, most of you are young people here. You probably don't know this, but in the, even up to the, in the 60s, if you went to Mass, Mass is what we would call a church service. If you went to Mass, they would read to you in Latin. In Latin. How many of you guys speak fluent Chinese right now? How many of you guys speak fluent Latin? No. The Hispanic himself, you can't even carry two paragraphs with them because they speak what we call Tex-Mex, right? Part in Spanish, part in English, and, and, and it's, 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 we don't seem to finish our sentences or our thoughts in a complete language. Well, the Holy Bible was there, but we couldn't read it. Mom, why don't we read Don't you read the book? And here's what, something that happens. When you're growing up, if you love the Lord and you're seeking the Lord and you hear about things going on, you hear about Bible studies and this and that, at first, they're weird because they're not at your church, and churches used to fight, make us fight against each other. Not a good thing, right? But you start growing up, and you start maturing, and you finally open the Bible. When you start opening the Bible, you realize, oh, my word. God speaks to you and I through his word. We speak to him through our word. We pray, right? Communication has to go both ways. And you don't always have to take it from someone else, not the pastor, not the priest, not someone else. Communication wants man. God wants you to understand him. So read your Bible. Bible, as I shared with you before, it's an acronym for basic instruction before leaving earth. It's a good book. It's a great book for you to read. All right. So here they are, right? And so the second thing that we read, which was shock and, and still our difference with Catholicism, you know, kind of like different ways that people worship is that they will say to you that Mary is a perpetual virgin or was a perpetual virgin, which means they say she only had Jesus and that was it, you know. And when you say, like, Grandma, have you read this? Or cousin, have you read this? We don't read the Bible. You know, but, but this is what it says. Can I open your Bible? No, don't touch my Bible. It's the Holy Bible. And I know you. You're my grandkid. You haven't been too holy. That's why you're getting cold for Christmas, right? And, you know, so... But here's the thing, when you start reading it, like you just read it now, did you not read it? It mentions the other children, right? These were half-brothers and sisters of Jesus. It mentioned four of them, four boys and at least two girls, sisters, so there's six, you know. Uh, and so you're looking at this, and when Jesus, no, she wasn't a perpetual virgin. What we know is what a great dad Joseph must have been. I mean, think about this, and we learned in our marriage retreat yesterday when we were comparing good guys of the, uh, of the Bible as husbands, you know, Joseph could have had Mary stoned to death. That was the culture. She's saying to him, hey, Joe, which we'll call him Joe, as Pastor shared with us yesterday. They were very close. <coughs> hey, can I just be truthful with you? Well, sure, Mary. Of course you can be truthful. I mean, can I really be truthful? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have a son. Now, Joe knows he hasn't touched her, you know. And the question that we all want to ask is, who's the man? Who's the other guy? You know, we have this thing, right? 
Well, she goes, well, it's not like that. You see, the Holy Spirit has come upon me, and there I go, you know, and it's like prophecy. I mean, what do you think? He says, it says in the Bible, <coughs> what kind of character that he had now. He heard the news, right? And now his character, he wanted to put her away secretly, wanted to kind of hide this uh, as a shame because he knew how everybody else was going to respond. And so it's an amazing thing. Here he raises these other kids, you know, and then somewhere along, we don't hear from Joseph anymore, but obviously he was busy for a while. There's that family, right? So, so we have that. Now think about this for a second. Back to our context. Jesus' brothers and sisters did not possess the same power, the same wisdom that Jesus did. And so put these reasons together. These people, the Nazarenes, thought they knew him, but they did not. They had seen him grow up in their town, but they were not about to trust Jesus as the son of God. And they were not about to trust him as their long-awaited Messiah. Therefore, their unbelief hindered Jesus from doing much in his hometown. And verse 3 ends again that they were offended at him. A church, literally, what offended means, it, it means that they, were stum they stumbled over him. They just couldn't put it together. It, it di didn't fit with their way of thinking. And the Greek word for stumble, in this context, gives us our English words, scandalized. Therefore, since they could not explain him, they rejected him, thus making Jesus for them a stone of stumbling because of their unbelief. Now, perhaps if Jesus had returned to Nazareth as a conquering hero, they might have accepted him more readily. But he came humbly, he was gracious, and all of this offended them. Verse 4, let's look at what Jesus says. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And it's almost as if Jesus kind of wants to excuse their behavior. We're not told that he did, but you know and I know that it's very true. You know, among those who, who you know, it's pretty hard for them to accept that you've gone born again or that you're now going to church on Sunday. Some of them are shocked when we tell our family members that. Some of them don't believe us at all. It was hard for Jesus' Uh, for Jesus' hometown to honor him because they were familiar with him and his family. And sometimes our families uh, don't ever see us any different. I'm sure his disciples were blown away at the unbelief and the dishonor towards Jesus from his own people. But this is a lesson that they had to learn. You're not always going to be well received. When I went into the army, volunteered for Vietnam in 1972, uh, I wound up in Germany. Now, get this. Right? Was I wrong to think that everyone loves Americans? I was raised this way. That the whole, we, we've been so kind to the rest of the world. We've done so much for everyone in the world. And when I landed in Frankfurt, Germany, and went to my first duty station, I think it was Kaiserslautern, uh, I was an MP pulling white hat duty, I never realized how many people hated Americans. And then I saw, I arrested some of the GIs that were drunks and this and that, and I realized, well, this could be part of the reason, you know, and how we blared our music all loud. You know, Cisco Kid was a friend of mine. They say, who's Cisco? You know, I, it's just a whole different world. So I could see some of it, but they really didn't like Americans. And I realized that later on as an adult when you travel overseas or you're somewhere, not everybody likes us. In fact, it's quite clear now, you know, through our news, most people hate Americans. For Jesus, coming to his hometown, you know, the disciples are realizing, oh, my goodness, the rest of Israel loves this man who has done so much for them. But his hometown, they don't like him at all. They, too, perhaps thought that they would have thrown a party and have a parade, but it didn't happen. We need to learn from this. As Jesus has changed you for the best, and as you begin to share Christ with others, you may be better received away from home than at home with the people you grew up with and are most familiar with your old ways. Many of us have certainly been rejected by our family, by our friends, uh, who we too were close with, but they do not appreciate the new you or your ministry. I uh, grew up in East L.A. I come from a family of five. I'm the second boy, There's, so I have two brothers and two sisters. And uh, I was branded the black sheep coming up to school and, and whatnot. Uh, and they knew me that way. 
and, and so going to the army was actually, don't, don't think he was all patriotic and whatnot. It was an escape from East L.A. <laughs> it was something better than where I was at. So I volunteered, as many of other guys do. And, and uh, when I came, I learned a lot. You grow up a lot in the army. I'm sure you do. And, and you come home. And when I came home, things had changed. And, of course, I started working in aerospace in Orange County because I was away from the East L.A. area, and I worked 17 and a half years there, and I had moved away, made my homes outside. And, and I vi- while I visited my family for Christmas and stuff, all this time I was growing up in the Lord as well uh, and, you know, went through college and everything else. And, and yet my, every time I'd come home, my dad and my mom would always see me as that 13-year-old, 15-year-old black sheep. My brothers and sisters would always see me as that black sheep. And so... Here I am, I'm 60 years old, mom and dad are gone uh, with the Lord, but when my brothers hear me and I go home, I see my sisters, and, and I share with them what the Lord is doing in Montrose, they look at and say, <laughs> do they really know you? You know, do they really know, do they really know? I've been married with Judy, my wife, 34 years, thank God, right, 34 years, and when I'm with my sisters, they always tell Judy, oh, Judy, you don't know Ben. My sisters are younger. They only knew me when I was a kid. And they, say, they tell Judy, oh, you don't know him at all. We know him. That's what Nazareth was doing. We know Jesus. We know Jesus. They did not know him. Perhaps you're here today also, raised up in religious ways. And you have something up here, a little something about knowing God or knowing something about the Lord. But if I ask you when is Jesus' birthday, you have to think before you say Christmas, right? And then you say, well, really, the historians say perhaps more in spring, uh, you know, and we really don't know. And that's not where I'm going with that because we're going to celebrate because that's when we celebrate his birthday. And he knows it. He knows we're not perfect. Anyway, the point is, if I asked you, how old was he when he died, you know, did he have brothers and sisters? Sometimes we, we don't have those answers. You know, was he a prophet? How was he a prophet? Was he a king? How is he a king? You know, uh, what, what was he doing here in the first place? A lot of people, well, we know a little bit. But we don't really know him. Can he be real to you as he was real to these guys? You think he could come into your heart? You know, when we talk about he saved us, saved you from what? You know, can you fill in the blanks? A lot of people think you know, but you don't know. The Nazarenes did not know him as who he was, the Messiah. They did not know this. So for us, lessons learned. You know, I came all the way from East L.A. over here. <laughs> Yesterday, our boys went to play in Denver area, and they lost. You know, last week when we had our playoffs here, our high school football team, uh, it's always this way. When someone comes from another town, we think, oh, man, those guys are bigger than ours. Oh, this and that. And we always think we're better. I was telling first service this morning, those of you who work in water here in Montrose or in Ridgeway or whatever, if you're a ditch rider and then we, you, you take that resume to Los Angeles or San Diego right now, and they say, what do, you, what do you do over there while I deal with water and stuff like that? They will give you the highest office around because those people are in a drought right now. They don't, and, and the ditch rider will say, well, what do you do as a ditch rider? I'm kind of make sure that the, uh, and they'll put it in a fancy way, that uh, the people who are consuming the water, because we are on a water conservation project, they have the certificate. You know how they speak all fancy, but really they're, they're, they're water cops. Don't you be spilling the water from the ditch, right? Well, we know that because we're from here, right? But, but those guys down there, they'll think, oh, man, you know, we have misused our water. We like to do this and that. And why? Because you're from another place. You're from another place. But if you, if you tell one of us from Montrose, I'm from Olathe, <laughs> we get it, you know. It, you know, we, we know exactly. And if, if we tell a guy from Olathe, where are you from? I'm from Manhattan Island. They look at us, and the first thing they're going to say, do you have a sprinkler system? Yeah. Did you already kind of uh, take care of it? Did you winterize your system? And the guy from New York or the guy from East L.A. is going to say, why? Dude, your pipes are going to break. They're going to crack, right? So someone from somewhere else, it's, we look at them different and whatnot. We admire them for that. We lost yesterday, sorry. My daughter was all disappointed back to that football game. Uh, we lost that playoff game. And uh, she says, Dad, how come it doesn't affect you? She says, because I'm a Rams fan. And if you follow the Broncos, they're doing good. And who are we playing today? The, you know, the Broncos. So they're going to kill the Rams, right? I mean, it's, it, the writing's on the wall. But so I said, learn to hurt, honey. It's good for you. You know, <laughs> coaches' wives, they suffer so much. 
All right. So these guys did not take him serious. They thought he was the same person. And so we get to verse 5. Look at your Bible. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few people and healed them. Church, the majority of Jesus' hometown people brushed him off. But thank God there is always a remnant, always some that do not follow the crowd, and that's a good thing because they come out and they trusted Jesus and he healed them. Lesson learned for you and I. Though you are rejected, when you go home and share your family about Christ, especially during the holiday season, though you do whatever you can and most of them brush you off, not always, not all of them, all of them will. There will be someone there. There will be someone there. Those that put their prejudice aside and came to Jesus believing in him, they were not disappointed. The Bible says he laid his hands on a few people and healed them, healed them. Those that would, would acknowledge him, those that had heard and said, I need to be healed. Would you, would you touch me? You know, like the lady, the doctors had, had taken all her money. She had nothing else, but the Lord healed her because she put her faith in him. And so same right here. Six. And he, Jesus, he's looking back and he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Church, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. That is, their unwillingness to put their prejudices, their own ideas aside and believe, put their faith in the reports that they had heard of, his godly works, those miracles that had taken place. Now, church, obviously, Jesus was rejected in Nazareth, but he did not allow himself to become discouraged. Here's a lesson for you and I. He didn't quit the business of Father God. He continued, it says, and he went about the surrounding villages teaching the word. So let me ask you, have you been discouraged when you have tried to share with your family, when, with those closest to you? Have they looked at you and said, <laughs> yeah, right, well, talk to me next year. You know, I, I know who you are. Do they do that to you? And, do, and, and, and fine, they're going to do that. But here's the thing. Let me talk to you personally. Have you let that discourage you? For now your hands are tied and you feel like you can't say anything. If that's you, I want you to wake up. Because Jesus did not do that. Jesus, and you say, well, yeah, but I'm not Jesus. So what? We're supposed to be like him. He's supposed to be the one we have our eyes on. He's, he's our model. He's the author and finisher of your faith. That's what the Bible says, right? So he continued to do this thing for the Lord. Maybe your friends can't get past your BC days, before Christ days. So let's learn from Jesus. Number one, he did not allow himself to be discouraged. So let's follow his lead. That's a practical way for us to come out of that. Let's follow his lead. Don't allow yourself to become discouraged, you know, as most people would. Secondly, Jesus continued about his father's business by going about the surrounding villages. So should you. If you're one brother or your one cousin rejects your sharing about Christ, it doesn't mean that the whole family is going to. Therefore, continue to be about your father's business and share Jesus with the rest of your family members, those who will. From verse 5, we learned that a few people did avail themselves to Jesus, and they were healed by him. So it may be true as an experience for you, as you call someone and you share with them, as you talk to one of your cousins about the Lord, he's going to say, man, but everybody used to say you were the black sheep. People talk about, hey, I received my first bike when I was 13 years old. And you're from East L.A., you sold your first bike by the time you were 13 years old. You know, that's just the environment we grew up in, you know. And, and, so, and so when people are saying, well, you know, uh, Ben, but what about this? And you used to do that. And we say, you're right. I failed. I'm a sinner. I did spend time in jail. I was hooked on, uh, on drugs, and I was an alcoholic, and I couldn't put it down. And I used to tell everybody, I'm not an alcoholic, but I have my two beers. Except if I was at your house, I'd ask you if you have more, and I drank all of yours, right? That's how we were at one time. But the Lord has taken that away from us. The Lord has allowed us to see beyond that. And so we tell our friends, he could do the same for you. I don't know, bro. I don't know. I, be, I, you know, I don't know. It's been 20 years. It's been 30 years. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the one that breaks the chain to any kind of addiction. Jesus is the one that could break the chain. If you're a guy that can't hold it together, 
talking to uh, other people I know. Why are you still hitting your wife? I saw my dad do it. I guess I, I just can't stop and tell her. Do you know she's going to leave you one of these days? And if I see her, I'm going to tell her, run and lend her my car to get out of there. And even some of the girls don't leave because their moms didn't leave and because they never knew any different. That that's not the way it's supposed to be. And Satan has such a hand and control on these families. And where are you and I? that can go and share with them as Jesus shared with others. And, and fine, you're not going to receive me, but I'm going to share with the ones that hear, that, that will hear me. Jesus can break those chains. Whatever chains are holding you back, Jesus Christ is still the answer for them. Maybe you're a guy that listened to your family, and not like Jesus, you put your eyes on you. And so you went back into a shell, and now you don't share any, with anybody that you're a Christian. And that has come true because I've gone and families have called me, would you bury my husband? Would you bury my son? Would you bury my wife? First thing I ask them, are they Christians? Well, they, you, know, are, you, know, you know, these last 10 years have been very difficult, but they went to Sunday school once upon a time. Well, maybe that's that Sunday school kid that became depressed when he was rejected for sharing the gospel. You can't stay there, man. If you know God touched your life, if you know God broke those chains in your life, and you have gone through this rejection stuff, and you slipped into depression, and you've never said anything else, I want to encourage you to follow Jesus' example. He went around, and it says he preached in a circuit. A circuit means if he was here in Montrose, if Nazareth was Montrose, he went to Ridgeway. He went to Kelowna. He went to, to Olathe. He went to Delta. He went to Gunnison. He went wherever he could, sharing about Jesus, that Jesus is still the answer. Well, he shared about God, that God loved him. And that's what he started showing his disciples. So we come next week, we pick it up where we left off here, and watch what he does with these disciples now that have been under his care in OJT. And next week, we begin the part where he sends them out. But this week, as we close, You are called to do the work of an evangelist. You might not be, old people know this guy, Billy Graham. You, not, you might not be, new people, a great glory. But everyone is called to do the work of an evangelist. That means this, share your story. Don't share my story. Share your story. What has God done for you? What has God done in your marriage? What has God done in your life? What has God done in your singleness for the Lord? What is the Lord doing for you? Share what you know. When people want to say, well, let me tell you about Dr. So-and-so and this and that. I don't care about Dr. So-and-so. You give me a headache. You know, I don't care about them. What I know is that once I was lost, but now I'm found. That's what I know. What I know is that one time I was the black sheep. They had every reason to call me that. But I know what Jesus did with this black sheep. He's cleansed me when my heart is white as snow. That's what Jesus can do. I don't know about all these programs and addiction, this and addiction, and I don't know about that. I know that one day I asked Jesus to take away my drinking, and he did. And my wife, Catholic girl, grew up in that, that kind of environment for the first time, turned Pentecostal when it, and said hallelujah. And then she looked at her, herself, did I really say that? Because I had stopped drinking. I came out of a church. And I took my carton of cigarettes and threw them away that day because I didn't want any more addictions. And if it led me to something, if it led me to think I'm tough with the boys, well, that's the wrong one, you know, this one, you know, and doing all your little circles and things and throwing the smoke through that, I did all that. But one day, Jesus broke the chain, took away that stuff from me. I know that, and that's what I'm comfortable with sharing with you. The God of the Bible can change your life. If you have a story, that's what the Lord wants to share with others who have no hope. With others who think that that's their life for the rest of their life. It doesn't have to be. I remember my dad still got into an argument with my mom. We were there as a kid. He took the broom that he was sweeping with and broke it over her head. We were kids and we saw that happen. And, and so a lot of people say, oh, my dad, you know, is the best teacher in the world. Well, my dad taught me some good things, but he also taught me some bad things. 
And unless you are told that Jesus can break those things, those chains, those habits, those Satan habits that we have, you know, you'll live the same life up. But I'm telling you, Jesus can help you save brooms, guys. You know, Jesus can help you keep it together. You know, Jesus can have you save your money that you pay on cigarettes. You know, when I came back from overseas, you know, I'm telling you, I was shocked. I was in Fort Dix, New Jersey, out processing, coming back to L.A., and I, was, I had packed my cartons of cigarettes. And I remember going to the bar, and I paid actually 55 cents a pack when I was paying 20 cents in Germany. I was shocked that cigarettes are that much. Today, I hear that they're over five bucks. And if you're a two-pack person, that's 10 bucks a day. 30 days in a month, right? How many bucks? Yeah, times that a year, times that umpteen years. You could have bought a house. You know, you could have bought 10 new cars. It's ridiculous what Satan has us hooked on, thinking that. And then here's the thing, well, it's not a big deal to smoke, dude. Didn't you hear that they busted the people that make them because they put in stuff to addict you to them? Read the Surgeon General stuff. It's true. You will die from this stuff. You say, well, I've got to die of something. Well, that's your choice. Be a chaplain and go to Montrose Hospital and see the ones that are dying of emphysema. You know, go around here, the ones that are carrying oxygen everywhere they go, not the ones that just happen to have the, you know, something with the lungs. Pastor Chuck Smith died of lung cancer, and he never smoked a day in his life. You know, so I'm not saying everyone, but those of us that push it, Jesus can free you from that. And I trust that you let.